Welcome to the Wholesaling Inc. podcast. I'm your host, Chris Arnold. As always, excited that you guys are with us today. This is going to be a fun talk. Um, there's some interesting layers here um, that I've not found in uh, some of the guests that I've interviewed so far. And so I'm really excited to introduce you guys to Jose uh, Varela. Um, this is a real estate investor that's been in the game for a few years. And we're going to talk about a couple of things here. First of all, what he does for a living, which is super cool. I think it's one of those things that's just kind of sexy. And if you're watching the video, we'll kind of give you a sneak peek of he'll be able to actually show it to you. So you'll be able to see that on YouTube. But also this concept of like, well, what if I'm working a nine to five but I love what I do. Like, I'm not trying to get out of the rat race, but I do want to create some additional income. How might you structure your business differently if you're not trying to like scale this thing? You're just trying to create some income. And the way that Jose has uh, kind of structured how he's doing his deals, I got to be honest with you, I haven't really come across someone that's focused on this model. So I think if you hear it, you might be like, that might be a fit for me because I'm going to tell you this. He has uh, probably more freedom of time doing wholesaling the way that he's doing it than most people are doing it as well. And of course, he's been utilizing radio. So already on five stations um, after just being an REI radio for four months. So that should tell you something if someone already scales up to five stations. So we're going to touch a little bit on each of these things today. So Jose, what's up, buddy? Welcome to the show. Excited to have you, man. What's up, Chris? Uh, excited to be here. Yeah. So let's go back to 2016 because I asked you the question, why? Why did you decide to pick up real estate kind of as a side hustle to make more income? I was like, you know, are you doing it for family security, long term legacy? And you said, well, actually, I had a situation that came up that really kind of made me rethink um, how I set up my life and particularly what I want to allow people to be able to do or not do to my overall well-being. So let's start with the why, like what happened in 2016 for you? Yeah, back in 2016, um, there was the, the gentleman that I worked for sold this company and then he sold it in 2013 and in 2016, it was, it was an oil company. Oil market didn't want to do it too well. So they, the new, the, the new people that bought the company, they decided that they didn't need the department where I, where I was working. And so they just kind of hacked everybody. I thought I was at a pretty secure place. The, the, the guy that I worked for, which I still do t to today, but um, he's a great guy. But when he sold it, there was new ownership and uh, they thought differently than he did. So they just kind of hacked it, hacked it at the, at the root there, they just got rid of all of us. And I just didn't like that somebody in some high rise, wherever they were sitting, decided to just kind of give us all the boot. And then my family's financial security was really gone by somebody's decision over there. So anyways, I was- You, they, you didn't even know some person and yeah. some corporate office decided to make some decision and that trickled all the way down. And you sat back and go, wow, that person's decision just affected my livelihood. Uh, I'm not going to let that happen again, right? Like you stepped back and that was kind of a, an aha moment for you, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to, I would, I, I did not want to, I, I actually told myself, I will never put myself in this spot again. If, if, if where I work goes away, it, I got to be okay to just kind of step into something else. Yeah. And so, so your mindset was kind of diversify to, you know, have a stream of income doing what you love to do, which we'll talk about, but also have this additional stream of income via real estate and wholesaling that can't be taken away from you that you could also fall back on as well. So that was like a defining moment for you, right? Now you're yes. a real estate investor that's doing deals in a few cities, right? So Corpus, uh, Beaumont, Houston, et cetera. But let's get to kind of like what you do for a living, because this is kind of cool. So tell the audience like what you do and actually like where you're at right now as we're talking. Sure. So I work for um, an individual that has uh, his own private jet for him and his family. And um, so I, I'm charged with taking care of the airplane in regards to maintenance and some of the legalities that come from the FAA. 
um, scheduling the maintenance, but budgets for the maintenance, just things related to maintenance. On, that's on pretty cool. Airplane. I mean, to be able to be around a, a private jet, to be able to kind of focus, that's kind of like your baby, right? That's your jet. Yeah. That family expects you to take care of it, to ensure safety. And again, I know you're listening. If you're on iTunes, you didn't see it, but he literally just took his camera, scrolled over out the window. And like, you can see the private jet, like sitting right there in the hangar. So curious, what kind of a jet is it for those that might like I love jets and I follow that type of stuff. What type of private jet is it? The one right outside the window is a Falcon 50, but the one that he has is so we're off to the side. Uh, that's a Citation Latitude. Nice, nice. And so how how long have you been in the kind of the arena of like I love being a mechanic and like working on private jets and so forth? Like how when did you find out that like that's your passion, that's your thing? Uh, well. I'm from South Texas, and when I was 15, I was visiting an uncle of mine. He brought a flyer for my cousin to see if he would be interested in doing that. He was like 18 or 19. He said, man, he didn't want nothing to do with it, and I just asked my uncle if I could keep that flyer, and I ended up going back to South Texas. He gave it to me. I, I kept it, and in, in 98, when I ended up making my way up here uh, to Houston, I was 17 or 18, I started to pursue that because I didn't even know it existed until my uncle brought that flyer, really, because just I wasn't around that stuff. So, yeah, ever since around 15, I guess, 15, 16. Yeah. So you've been doing this a long time. And here's what I love that you said. You love what you do. You're not the person that maybe I typically interview that's doing a nine to five where they go, I'm trying to get out of the rat race. Like, you wake up every day and you're like, I really have a lot of enjoyment into the career that I poured myself into, right? Yeah, I've been doing it physically for 20 years and I absolutely work for the best family in Houston. I love the guys that I work for. They treat us very good in every way, pay, all of that. They just, I, I just love it. I don't have no intentions in leaving here. Unless they fire me, then I'll go to something else. Yeah. So I'm just curious, is there any type of cool perk that you get kind of working for a family in the private jet? Like anything like you love most about what you do? Um, I don't know. A perk? No. What I do, it's like if one of the benefits is like if the airplane's away, since I'm only charged with one airplane, then I, I come to the office to kind of get out of the house, but the airplane's gone, right? So there's nothing for me to do on the airplane. Um, and if the airplane's here, I kind of make sure everything's good. The pilots didn't give you any squawks. Then I just turn it over, make sure it's ready for the next flight. And then I just wait till the next flight. Is you here. have flexibility with what you do. Really? That's kind of the perk and the benefit. It's not like you show up every day and you're like constantly working on this plane. Hence the fact that you've got some time to kind of pick up this side hustle of wholesale. So you've got some freedom in what you do. So that's kind of cool. Not only do you love what you do, it's also accompanied with the fact that you've got some freedom. Now, let's talk about this. This is where it gets interesting. You are doing deals, but you're doing it in a different way. You have figured out that you want to be the guy that creates motivated seller leads. So fundamentally a marketer, but you don't want to be the boots on the ground. You don't want to be out there you know, shaking hands with sellers, converting these deals, getting contracts signed, dispoing. So what you do is you just focus on the marketing side and then you refer these leads out to some key JV uh, investors that you have relationships with. And then you just do a 50-50 split. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. As the calls come in from radio, I kind of vet them. And if they're pretty much hotter. If they need follow-up, I'll do the follow-up. But if they're ready to go, I just send them to my JV partners. They go out, meet with the seller, lock it up, find the buyer, sell it. And then at the title company, they just kind of distribute the, the assignment fee between the both of us. So besides the obvious reason that this gives you a lot more time because you're not out there converting deals, number two, it, it helps you to be really focused at getting good at one thing. And that's just marketing because you don't have to worry about your sales conversion process. You don't have to worry about dispoing all the other aspects. 
what, what was the main motivator for structuring your business this way to where you go, I'm just going to be fine doing 50, 50 JVs all day. And I'll let them do all the grunt work out there and be the boots on the ground. Like it's fascinating to me. What's the motivation behind this for you? Why? In reality is, is the freedom of the schedule because the here, if a flight pops up right now, then I kind of have to be here. You know, I have to be available. Although there's some freedom in schedule when the airplane is here, if they decide to fly, we kind of have to be ready for that. And I can't be visiting a seller two hours down south or an hour the other way or anywhere in Houston, really it's about an hour drive if you, Houston pretty big city. I can't be stuck with a seller on an appointment and they have a flight, then I can't, I can't be here. And gotcha. Cause you're I'm, a little bit on call, right? You might not sure when the family needs to, you know, say, Hey, uh, gear the jet up. We're heading to this place or that okay. way. So you can't be two hours away to do that. So let's break this structure down. Cause I think some people might be hearing this and going, this is interesting. So first of all, how do you find the right JV partner, right? There's a lot of investors out there. I would imagine the key part of the equation is aligning yourself with the right investor. How did you go about finding the right people that you could trust your leads with that you've spent money marketing to generate? I, I went on Facebook groups and I kind of, in the markets that I'm in and Houston, uh, I kind of saw who was doing deals pretty regularly and then i reached out to several of them talked and there were some that i kind of connected with some that i didn't and the ones that i connected the best kind of took the conversation to the next thing right and say hey look i'd like to this is what i'm doing in your market i'd like to see if you'd be interested in jv and and here's how i see it working and they're like yeah man they agreed i agreed and then we and then i would i tested with a you know send the leader to and make sure that things being followed up and Doing yeah, their process and uh, just there's a little bit of trust in the beginning because it's obviously somebody you don't know, but you got to trust people too. And then until they prove me, that's I mean, until they prove me that I can't trust them, I'm going to trust them. Makes and, sense. Now, how, how long did it take you to find the right ones? Because it sounds like, again, you go on Facebook, you're looking for people that are seasoned. Again, you can tell a lot about an investor you yeah. know, in forums and what questions are asking. So I kind of like that that's a good kind of level one pre-qualification, right? So once you started these conversations and you brought some on, did you find you got it right the first time or did you make a couple of mistakes and have to replace them until you got the ones that you wanted? Um, down in Corpus, I lucked out and I made the right decision right off the bat. He's been great. Uh, and I did that with agents too, but then in Beaumont, I've had to kind of go through a couple and just find the one that really meshes, you know, try it a little bit. And then the conversations kind of go south or you get the feeling they're not following up on something. Yeah. And I just, I just leave it alone. I don't, I don't say nothing more. I just go find another one. That's interesting. So what have you found? Let's say someone's listening to this and going, I, I might actually look at doing something like this, maybe virtually in another market um, that I don't want to do the deals in myself. What do you feel like are like the top, maybe couple characteristics that like, let's say uh, your corpus person that you like so much that's worked out well, what are the top two characteristics that make a great investor to do this kind of JV model with? For me was availability. Uh, Sometimes he's in that market. And if I'm kind of talking to a seller, and I'm not sure if it's going to be a deal. I, I just text him really quick. Hey, man, uh, what do you think about this? Where would we need to be? And, you know, he's very responsive. And then uh, along with the availability, the back half of that is the updates on, hey, we met we went with them. We met with the seller. We locked it up. It's going to title. And then obviously when things go to title. So availability CC, and good communication, right? Those are the two key pieces. Now, when you reached out, were they like super interested? Like you didn't have to convince them about this. Like they were all over the idea or did you feel like you had to kind of sell them on the concept a little bit? Uh, no, that, the, the, the general in Corpus, he was all about it. He said, Oh yeah, man, I do that all the time. This is kind of how we do it. It's said, perfect. That's kind of how I see it working. And uh, so he, he was already doing some, some of that with some, some other wholesalers there in the area. Um, the one over here in, in Beaumont, there was, it, it was a struggle, like 
so you want 50 percent for me to go out lock it up and do all the work i'm like yeah and he's like are you crazy i said well do you want to pay for half of the marketing and he's like oh i don't want to do that (laughs) that's a great objection handler by the way you want to pay for half the marketing no i'll do the 50 50 on that as well and so then you have structured these to be a 50 50 split so you cover the marketing costs, you provide the lead, you do a little bit of prequal, and then you pass it over. Is there anything else about this model that someone needs to understand if they think that they might want to pursue this a little bit more? Or is that most of it right there? I, I, yeah, I think that's most of it. Uh, the, obviously, the, the, the number one thing for me, the way I have so much piece of it is because I really believe I got the right people there and they can communicate well. Um, I think without that, I'd be a little anxious to see if things are actually happening the way they need to. Uh, but but if you just get that one piece right, then I think I think you'll be at peace. Right. So if you're newer, I want to kind of explain something a little bit different. There's the concept of coal wholesaling, um, and this isn't really coal wholesaling. Coal wholesaling is hey. Uh, I have a great buyers list. I'm going to go find newer investors um, that have locked up a deal, but they don't know how to move it. So therefore, I'm going to kind of be the back end and I'm going to dispo that property. So that's really kind of coal wholesaling, um, you know, kind of maybe you might heard like the Keegley model, right? Astro flipping, et cetera. This really isn't coal wholesaling. This is a guy that fundamentally says, I'm just going to be kind of the chief marketing officer, the front end. I'm not even going to get it under contract. I'm just going to make sure it's a good lead and I'm going to pass it along. And then at that point, like Jose's done, right? And what he's saying is as long as they're accessible and more importantly, I don't have to chase them because they're calling me constantly and updating, you know, for the most part, he's just kind of waiting for his check to come in. And I love the split, Jose, that you negotiate on that. You know, 50-50 is great for the fact that you're paying for the marketing and then they are pretty much doing all of the sweat work that's involved in that. So I think it's a really cool model. And in someone listening, like I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's a good hybrid model. Maybe in your town, you're doing your own deals, but you want to go to another market um, virtually, whatever that looks like. And you're like, I don't necessarily want to hire an acquisition manager and manage all of that and so forth. You could potentially do just a little bit of a JV relationship like this. But I think it's cool that like you just don't close any of the deals. You just pass the lead along and take the 50-50 split. So I love it. Super interesting. And I, I applaud you. And this is why I love real estate. It's just wide open to creativity. You can do deals however you want to structure deals. And if you look at Jose's story, right? Number one, I never want to be caught like I was in 2016, where someone can pull the rug out from under me. So I'm going to create another stream of income. Number two, I love what I do. So I want to make sure I continue to focus on that. And number three, I really got to protect my time because my job and what I do requires me to be a little bit more on call. So I feel like you took your life and what you wanted, and then you built the business around it to fit that. And I think most people do it the other way. They bend their lives to fit whatever model they hear about, or, Hey, I want to be like this person. And so I, first of all, applaud you for customizing this thing to fit your lifestyle. Um, That's the way that I think Uh, you you build everything around your life and the way you want it to look. And either you're going to serve your business or your business is going to serve you. And the way you've structured this is your business is serving your lifestyle, which I think is amazing. So very cool. Hats off to you. Super awesome. So let's talk about radio, right? So you've been advertising now on radio for four months. You're already on five radio stations. So you have snowballed this thing. So the first question I know everyone's wondering is how much is your monthly spend on five radio stations right now? Like you take all those stations, put them together. What's your total monthly spend? $1,800 for five stations. So again, if you guys understand what we show and teach in radio, we're showing how to buy radio at like 25 cents on the dollar. So that's how someone like Jose can have a portfolio of five stations. And again, hats off to you that your entire budget is $1,800. Now, before radio, you were doing cold calling, right? So talk a little bit about that journey, cold calling, you transitioned to radio. Why did all of this happen? What, What was the evolution here? 
the the thing about cold calling there towards the end of the year, it, it was just, man, just buying the lists, having to see if the leads that are coming in are good leads or real leads. It just, it just too time. It, for me, it just was too time consuming. And then, man, the data is super expensive and you got to be buying it all. I just, for me, it just, I didn't like it. I just did not enjoy it. So, and, and that's what I tell everyone that's listening, right? It's like, you've got to find the marketing channel that fits your personality and your style. And if you love cold calling, continue to do cold calling. Jose did it. And he's like, man, this isn't a fit for me. So you started looking for something else. So now there's a lot of options out there, right? Of what you could have picked up next. Why'd you choose radio out of all the other channels that are out there? The, the, I chose radio because actually when I heard the podcast, we were in Disney World and you put a podcast on about your five mentors. I think it was something like that. Yeah. And you said you had a mentor for, I think it was your marriage. And that is super important. I mean, we were on vacation and I told my wife, I said, look, I think I'm going to buy into this. This, this guy's talking about how he has mentors and he's a mentor and he has one for marriage. And that is really, truly very important to me. And uh, just because of that, I'm going to go into this. I was already thinking of doing something different, but that that's what made me buy radio. It wasn't even because I thought it was a good marketing channel. It was because <laughs> I heard you talk about that, but it's, it's turned out to be a great thing. I don't know. You don't think so. Yeah. Honest answer. Honest answer. So now that you've been doing radio, what are a couple characteristics that you are really enjoying about it versus, let's say, well, versus cold calling, which is, again, we're comparing that because that's what you were doing before. But what are you sure. liking about radio now from a uh, quality characteristic standpoint? OK, I, I, I love it because the people that are calling in first, I don't have to manage anything other than I just make sure the ads are running when they when they when they're supposed to be running in. So it's low uh, maintenance. It's kind of set yeah. it and forget it. It's not taking a lot of your time to manage the overall yep. channel itself. That's a big one. I hear that a lot. Yeah. And then the second thing is the people that are calling, they're actually wanting to talk to you. And my experience has been where I almost don't have to vet them very much. When they call, they start kind of spilling their story and telling me what they want for the property. And then, you know, they're not kind of, got to get into condition and stuff like that but i don't have to dig a whole lot of the other things that i was having to struggle so much with cold calling they're just kind of telling me their story yeah so you're finding that the quality of lead that's coming via radio is a lot higher and more importantly like they really want to talk to you yeah 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 i i do find there's kind of two different starting points if if you use a spam based approach like text blasting or rvming that's a long journey to get to a place where someone begins to kind of open up and know you like you trust you. But you're right. Radio is like, I'll use this analogy. It's like being, you know, someone that cuts hair. You know, when you just sit down in the chair, you just open up and just trust that person because you know what they do. Like, that's kind of how radio yeah. is. Like people call in and they're like, I know I can trust this person because people that are on the radio, you know, are seen to be credible and they're seen to be experts in what they do. And so they call in, they just kind of get right to the point. Like I already know you are good because radio has vetted you. You wouldn't be on radio if you didn't know what you're doing. So you kind of bypass the vetting process and you just get right into their story and their motivation for selling. Is that what you're finding? Yeah. And actually some of the people, uh, that's exactly right. And some of the people are actually surprised that I'm the one answering the phone. I guess they <laughs> thought it was some, some, I don't know. I'm like, no, that's me. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You're probably about the fourth or fifth person that said that on a podcast because you are elevated and have celebrity status. So people do not expect the person recording the ad to answer the phone, right? I don't care what company we're talking about. If you see a company on you know television or something like that you don't expect to call in and the owner and ceo answer the phone like yeah. it's just, that's just the power of mass media so you're right they're surprised that they get to talk to you which in my opinion then helps with the conversion right because they're like yeah. i'm talking to the head honcho here 
Like yeah. this is a person that runs the company. So if anyone's going to be able to figure out if they can help me or not, or the final decision maker, I'm already talking to the final decision maker because I heard him or heard her on the radio mm -hmm. ad itself. So those are some great qualities, man, uh, to point out about radio. And so some of the ones that I, I really like as well. Now let's get down to the numbers because I know that that's what people care about the most. So let's talk about what's been accomplished so far on the books. You've already closed out two transactions and that's a total of about, let's see if I add that together, uh, $25,800 already closed yep. out on the books. So again, if we're doing the math on your return right there over four months, again, super solid return, but you already have two more deals that you've already disposed, just waiting to close. And those are a combined two deals of another $40,000, right? So fundamentally right. you're 40 plus the, again, I'm just going to put that at 25. So you're fundamentally at uh, 40, 50, $65,000 so far when these next two deals close over the next week or two in the first four months. How are you feeling about that? Man, I am loving that, Chris. <laughs> I'm <laughs> loving that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And you're doing that with doing no labor whatsoever. All you're doing is marketing deals and then you're going out and doing what you love and that's tinkering on that private jet and just, you know, uh, being in the office and, and being available to do what you're super passionate about doing. So, Jose, I, I love your story. I think it's... Um, I love that you do something that you love. I think it's super cool what you do. There's kind of a sexy element to it. Um, I love the fact that you're kicking ass on radio and you found a marketing channel that you like. And I think the thing that should challenge most of us today is the fact that you're playing the game of real estate the way that you want to play it. I always tell people, you know, you've got to move from duplication to innovation, right? You know, when you get in, duplication in the beginning is good. It's okay. You don't want to come in and like recreate the will on everything. But at some point, you have to transition from duplication to innovation, or you're just going to be following the herd and doing what everyone else is doing. And so, Jose, I feel like you kind of came in and said, I'm going to kind of innovate a model that best fits my life. And so, man, just mad respect for that. So to so the rest of you guys, if you're listening Thank and you're you. like, man, this radio thing, pretty cool. Here's another guy that's doing it his own way and already at five stations and got $65,000 coming in within the first, you know, four, four and a half months. So, and you're like, man, I think this might be a fit for me. Um, we'd love for you to check it out and uh, see if we can add value to you and to see if this channel is a great fit for you. So you can go to wholesalinginc.com forward slash REI radio. Again, that's wholesalinginc.com forward slash REI radio book a call and uh, take a look and see if your market's open. So Jose, brother, I appreciate your time today. Super fun to kind of do a podcast while you're actually like sitting in the hangar where you work as well. And uh, thanks for coming in and kind of shaking things up today and getting us to think a little bit differently about how we might structure um, a real estate business. So it's definitely you're uh, going against the majority, which uh, I always applaud. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Chris. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. And to the rest of you guys, we will catch you soon when we add more value. Talk to you later.